I, I had even no idea that Hyundai and Kia, this is like the same company, you know. <laughs> so, so I, I researched about Korea. That mm -hmm. was the first thing I did. What, what is South Korea? And then I was fascinated by the history of South Korea. Yeah. Uh, all the war. And it was so much similar to Germany. And, but there was a big difference. I mean, South Korea, they got all this, this, this harmful se uh, time. And they didn't start the stupid things. Mm -hmm. yeah? Other countries started the stupid things. And, and they were suffering so much from that. Yeah. And in Germany, it's different. So Germany, we started all that yeah. stuff, you know, <coughs> and we didn't deserve any better, I think. But in Korea, it's a whole different story. They were suffering so much and then recovering from all this, yeah, and building up that, that growth in the whole industry in Korea. Uh, that was fascinating to me. From inside the Moto Man studio, these are extraordinary stories of ordinary folks and how they became the people shaping the car world, the tech world, and our future. What's that old saying? Do what you're passionate about and you never have to work a day in your life. Well, for most of us, our passions, we don't know exactly where they started, which means we don't understand them as much and the likelihood of them turning into our career is kind of slim to none. Then there's a small subset of us that we're lucky enough to have our passions, at least the seeds of them, born into our lives by someone important in our past, like our father, mother, sister, brother, somebody like that. And then of those people, there's a further subset that are lucky enough to draw a direct line from their passions back in the day, early on in life, to what they are doing today. That is the story of Albert Bierman, my guest that you know him very well because he's had a hand in developing virtually every BMW M car, both for the street and the racetrack for a 30 year period. Now he's running all of engineering for the fifth largest car company in the world. But what's most interesting is these two multinational car companies, he brings them back to what could only be termed as a tribal ritual that he shared with his father in Germany 45 years ago. How does a guy, or really a kid, from the metropolis, the thriving metropolis of Uste Aiden, <laughs> grow up one day and run performance cars for one of the top five car companies in the world. Yeah. Where do we start? Yeah, I can start maybe with my uh, hometown and uh, the business of my parents. Yeah. My parents uh, at that time and the family still has uh, a trucking business, logistics, so big trucks. So like and semis. Yeah, really big trucks. And I basically grew up in the workshop, in the truck workshop. And uh, yeah, every day like in there was kind of my playground, of course, playing soccer, going out in the forest. But you know, then when I got older, I mean, helping out on the Saturdays when all the trucks come in and so on. Yeah, repairing trucks. But then also very early, I started on my own machinery, like a bicycle. And then I had a motorbike and then I built my first car. So what were you excited about? Were you excited about the, a vehicle or just the, 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 the mechanical part, the engineering part? No, it was um, more the racing. I mean, the engineering was just uh, the necessity to repair my, my bike. I, I killed bike tires all the time, bicycle <laughs> tires. And the thing that brought me really into uh, this high performance and motorsport, first of all, uh, my father, he was one of those early BMW new generation uh, customers. So, so right after the Quants took over BMW in 59. Yeah, he, he bought uh, his first BMW. W was a 1500 and then an 1800 and a 2000. This is way back. Yeah, this was in the early 60s. And my dad, he was a race fan. So every year, two times, three times, he drove to the Nürburgring to watch races. But mom, he, she stayed at home. I mean, <laughs> so <laughs> it was just my dad and uh, my two brothers and myself. And I was the youngest. Oh, I, th I remember 65, I was in Nürburgring. I mean, I saw the, uh, the the old Formula One racers, Jack Brabham, Dennis Halm, those cars, those guys, then the later the sports prototypes, Joachim Bonnier and so on. So I had a whole bunch of these uh, race programs with m tons of autographs. My uh, dad, uh, he, since he had this trucking business, he uh, was a good customer of Continental Tires. At the end of pit lane, there was a Conti Tower at that time, at the, the good old Nürburgring. There was no Grand Prix track at that time, just a good Nordschleife. Mm. 
and South Schleife still exists a little bit of it. So, and to go to the Conti Tower, he got always free tickets from Conti. You could choose a way through the paddock. You didn't have to do necessarily, but he always picked the route. So we showed the Conti Tower cards, and they led us into the paddock. And then we walk around in the in the old paddock of Nürburgring. Yeah. This is a historic site now. Later, I worked my own race car in the same garages where I was watching the, the guys. Like Literally come full circle. My father really? already, he passed already away when I was 15. Oh, so you lost yeah. him young. Yeah, yeah. And also my brothers, they never were allowed to drive when we went to Nürburgring. So where did you make the shift from being a spectator at Nürburgring to, I want to make, I want to get some interest in cars myself? Mm. Where did that happen? Yeah, I started when I was 16 to be a rally co-pilot, uh, so my oldest driver drove, but it didn't work out. I Wait a minute, how I does a 16-year-old even figure out how to get into rally? Like, even know what rally is? Oh, the other brother already was a co-pilot in rally. My, my uh, oldest brother, he, he so did some So you were rallies. the youngest? I was the youngest, yeah. Of three? Yeah. So these guys are kind of leading you down the path of getting into rally? Yeah, rally was a start, just a starting point. Mm. But uh, the co-pilot didn't work. So I had to wait two more years before I could make my driving license. When I was 17, I bought a, a, a wreck Beetle, and it took me one year to build it up, to repair everything. I put a roll cage inside, the Recaro seats and everything. Yeah, Recaro seats into a Beetle. Yeah, and then I started, uh, it was a six-volt Beetle, 40 horsepower. And then I started doing uh, rally driving myself. So like I in organized rallies? Or you yeah, just yeah, we I was a member in the motorsport, the local yeah. motorsport club. and. Yeah, probably I was the youngest at that time, Pro probably, I don't know. My co-driver, he was uh, even two years younger than me, and he didn't get seasick, so we, we were a good team. And on the weekends, we were running through the forest of the Sauerland and in the, in the, in doing all this crazy rally driving, but it was more to figure out uh, the right route. Yeah. And of course, speed was involved, officially not. And yeah, this was when I made my first experience. And at the same time... Yeah, but how much speed are you getting out of a, a, a 40 horsepower Beetle? At that oh, time? that depends. It was good for 130, 140, downhill 150. <laughs> you know? So ki kilo <laughs> kilometers per hour. Now yeah. hold on, I'm going to stop you there. For so your mother not even has an issue with this. She's like, yeah, go on, kids rallying, not a problem. No, my mom was fine, no problem. She probably had a, the confidence that... Because she's seen your brothers do it, and your dad was into these things as well. Yeah, my dad not like doing motorsport, my, but my two brothers also, they did some autocross. Yeah. And Were so they on. in Beatles as well? Um, the, yeah, the other one had a uh, uh, S Beetle with 50 horsepower already. Oh, so he had the performance car. Yeah, yeah. But my oldest brother, he first started on an Opel only for one year, and then he got into the BMWs. So highly tuned 2002 BMWs. I'm seeing the BMW as a major family theme for you. We'll get to that later, but it's definitely a theme. For yeah, you. I mean, when my father passed away, he, he couldn't take me to Nürburgring anymore. More. But at that time, my brother already, the oldest brother, had his uh, highly tuned BMWs. And I was washing these BMWs for weeks that he takes me yeah. to the Nürburgring, and not only his girlfriend. So, <laughs> 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 so this was from five years old, Nürburgring in the summer, was a family tradition. It was a f family rite of passage. Mm, yeah. Up until you were, what, 20? Yeah, yeah. The math correct. Kind of, yeah. Then friends joined, my brother's friends, my friends. When yeah. I get the driving license, I started my own mm. Nürburgring parties. So we were like sometimes 20 people, campfire, like two meters high, drinking tons <laughs> of tons of beer, <laughs> you know, and making parties in the Nürburgring. That, that has a tradition in Nürburgring. Uh, to go there having party, watch racing. Yeah. See, that that is amazing. Like my, I lost my dad when I was young as well, and there were traditions that he did with me. And then it took me a while, because I, I was nine when he, dad, he died, but it took me a while to take those traditions and make them my own later on in life. It took me into my 20s. So I take my hat off to you. Actually, You actually literally continued that all the way through. Yeah, we did it much more excessive than my dad. I mean, he <laughs> just, he just <laughs> went, he went there Sunday morning, coming back Sunday night. And sometimes we went there Thursday, Yeah. repair everything, then the other guys come Friday or Saturday, yeah. and, and it was the whole partying weekend yeah with good racing you know? so okay answer me this y uh, y you've obviously heard of bathurst down in australia yeah yeah i've been there I so yeah okay i've never i want to go i drove it with the i30n prototype really yeah of course you know see so you're much cooler than they tell me they, these guys they don't tell me that you do this kind of cool stuff 
Mm, yeah. You, you know what? We got to do that together. That's <laughs> going to be our next thing we do. <laughs> but from what I understand for the spectators, the, the Australians, who are known to drink, uh, they limit the amount of beer you could bring. But the limit is something like 20 cases a person. Was mm. What were you guys bringing? Oh, the, the whole trunk is full of beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's step back from the adult beverages. Bring me back to that Beetle. Obviously, if you are uh, first a co-driver, then you're doing your driving yourself, and uh, I'm assuming that you're paying it for this yourself. H who's wrenching on the car? And wh where are you? Just me. Th that was a, just a Beetle. You you can do everything yourself. Oh. Yeah, I mean we had that workshop. Yeah. And we had a forklift, so changing the engine, no big deal. Take the Beetle on the forklift, <laughs> lose all the bolts, and I don't need any support. So, so that was your lift. You yeah, literally, you, yeah, had, you yeah. had a lift, it yeah. was just with a forklift. Yeah, this is a, a transport pallet on the forklift, then yeah. underneath the beetle. The first you lose all the bolts and nuts and stuff. Yeah. And then you just put a big oil can underneath the engine, you lift the beetle, one pull, and you have the engine there. So you weren't just engineering the car, wrenching on the car, you were engineering processes. I mean, the, ha you have no other choice. If you have to fix your engine because you killed it, you have to replace it, right? <laughs> <laughs> And did you use this car as a daily as well? Was yes. This oh yeah, yeah, so this was everything. Winter, summer, this was yeah, rally, yeah. this was everything. Yeah, of course. That was my car. But not for long. And did your, bro did your brothers teach you any of this or did you learn all this on your own? No, just, I mean, I grew up in that workshop. And of course, then, but I helped the, uh, the people working in the workshop when they fixed their own cars. They had Beetles, so I, I already knew how to fix a Beetle. So from five you were working on that shop? Yeah, with five more or less fixing my bicycle. Uh, <laughs> and then, and, uh, yeah, and yeah, I spent a lot of time in that workshop. Okay. So now, what are you? So we're, we're in your early 20s at this point. You're rallying. What, what happens now? Are you meeting girls? Are you focusing on girls? Um, Getting rid of the rallying? Or wh no, what's happening? Uh, girls, girls were there all the time. But <laughs> there were really? times when cars just had higher priorities. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I was playing soccer, but also only until I started building my beetle. Then I yeah. stopped playing soccer. And when there was a race in Nürburgring, and then okay. I had to go to Nürburgring if I had the chance to join my brother or my dad. Yeah. And then the coach of soccer was always like upset. Hey, you are part of the team. You cannot go just to Nürburgring. You have to play soccer. But th I mean, there was no discussion. I was just gone. I Nürburgring was Paris. much more important for me than playing soccer. Yeah, from the beginning. So did you have a problem because you were so focused on cars meeting girls at all? Oh, not at all. No, no. The girls came easy. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> did they like the cars? Uh, yeah, some, some, yes. My, I mean, my, my wife now, she was, uh, I met her in uh, school, high school. She, she likes cars. She drove my Beetle. When, we, when I go to autocross, yeah. then she took my car. I also did the run around the cones, autocross. And then she, several times she won the, 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 the golden cookie plates or something for the, <laughs> the, the, the women's category. So she was also a good driver. So you were able to meet a woman in high school that not only liked cars, but was willing to go out and do the actual events with you. Yeah, and later when I had my real race car, then she was a, a strong member of my team. Helping managing, <laughs> helping changing tires, and whatever you need in the paddock. So you're putting your wife to work changing tires, or your future wife at that point. Yeah, is that, that was... You, uh, sir, you, sir, are a legend. was a natural thing, yeah. Uh, when, when we married in, in her village, uh, at that time, after one year, I switched from the Beetle yeah. to, to a Simca Rally 2. So you're, are you winning money? Or you, is this no, I'll forget the money. So this is just... No, you're putting the your own dollars in, or excuse yeah. me, marks at that point into right. this whole thing. Yeah. And uh, what happens to university? Uh, do you go off to university or just stay doing this? No, no, no. no. Uh, so then uh, high school was finished and I go to university, but in Aachen, which was like 240 kilometers away from my hometown, my girlfriend at that time, she just went the other way. to Different girl than your wife? No, no, no. Still my this girlfriend at that time, now my wife. She was just in the other direction and every weekend we meet in our hometown area. And then every weekend, of course, uh, we go partying and yeah. I work on my car. We go, yeah. I do a lot of autocross yeah. driving on the weekend. She joined me. We do some autocross. And already once in a year, I drive a hill climb race. And there was a famous hill climb yeah. race in my hometown area. So, and then hill climb racing, autocross, I did for two years, three years with that first Simca. Mm -hmm. And then... I thought, okay, this is nice, but it's better to do real racing, track racing. Mm -hmm. And then I, I transformed this Simca Rally 2 and Simca Rally 3 
It wasn't sold in Germany, but you could transfer the car, build it, change it, bigger yeah. fenders, bigger tires, other engine, everything. So I, I did that. I built the race car from ground up with roll cage, everything. And then I had two very intense years of uh, track racing. I, I remember my first race, I got to Hockenheim. And at that time, Hockenheim still was uh, the long track with a fast uh, Ostkurve. I've never been there, but I watched so many races yeah. before in Nürburgring and other places. And I just, I just, yeah, play just the game. For it. Play so the you game. just thought, oh, you know what? I think it would be nice to go on a track, so I'm going to go buy a track car and go on a track. Yeah, I did the autocross before. At 18, you did this. No, that was later then. The, the track racing I did was 21, I think. So you were in university at that point. Yeah, during the university. Now, did time. you do any military service? Did you go no, no. Uh, that was the funny part. Uh, th they let me alone because I had a knee injury at that yeah. time, so I could finish my university time. The, uh, uh, the, the, the boss of our local motorsport club, yeah. he was at the same university. And it was like, at that time it was ABC. Mm -hmm. So the, the best three mechanical engineering, Aachen, Braunschweig, Karlsruhe. I said, okay, I go to Aachen. Yeah. Because he recommended, this is, this is a good university, mm -hmm. so I go there. And I have made great friends there. I still have them, my friends. And uh, so but there was a point. I did these two years of intense racing, and then I sold everything. Uh, not everything, but I, I sold the race car. I did this hill climb racing you yeah. know, once in a year in my hometown area. But I was a r racetrack driver. And the hill climb guys they were just laughing about these racetrack drivers <laughs> because <laughs> Going they don't have a lot of respect, you know. But uh -huh. in the hill climb, you have these two minutes where you might breathe or not, I don't know, but uh, every little mistake costs a lot of time and yeah. you can't catch up, mm -mm. you know? And, but this was my hill. And I went there with my rally too, with a street car basically, yeah. even without slip. So first year I go there, I finish nine. Next year I finish seven. Then next year I finish five with my rally two. Then I come with my real race car, rally three. Mm -hmm. And I finish three. And then I go there, race number five, one year later and I say, hey guys, you know what happened, you know, the last four years. You, you don't need to go up that hill. I will beat you anyway. Yeah? <laughs> I'm and sure they love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah. believe it or not, it happened. So I, I beat all the hill climb experts. So the fifth time was you I hit number one. I win. And then someone desperately wanted that car because there was one guy yeah. always winning with the same car all the hill climb races. Yeah. And the only car that ever beat that guy was my Simca Rally 3. And he said, okay, I need that car. So he thought it was the car, not the guy. Of course. So let's go back to your, your car guy, racer girlfriend. Is she now your wife? When, when, do, you, when do you guys get married? Yeah, uh, we got married then uh, just before finishing my university time. The military asked me to show up again. Mm -hmm. And then they said, okay, uh, your knee, everything is fixed. And now we, we want to have you on military service. Okay. And I knew already, if you marry, then y they have to pay for your family, basically. Oh. So I go to some consultant uh, and I discuss with him for like <laughs> one and a half hours. And then finally he say, okay, if you don't want to go to military service, so then just marry. And I said, Can I trust this fully? <laughs> 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 and then he said, no, no, yeah, but it's probably like yeah. that. So then I talk with my girlfriend at yeah. the time and say, hey, we need to marry. Otherwise, I have to go to military That's service. a very romantic proposal, Albert. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and she agreed, and we married. You know, and that wow. was it. And yeah, then when we married uh, in, in my area where I grew up, I mean, I built like a, like a group of crazy SIM card drivers. Yeah. yeah. We had four. Oh, share with everybody your, what is the famous beer that is near your, your town? The Warsteiner beer. Yeah. yeah. The Warsteiner beer. Yeah, this is uh, close to that area. I grew up and there's also that hill climb race yeah. very close there. So, but we come out of church, we, 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 we do the wedding, and then there is f three or four Simca Rally 2 mm. hooked up in the rear axle, mm -hmm. sitting on the front axle, without rear tires. So we come out of church, and we c it was all blocked. We couldn't escape. It's a tradition <laughs> in our area yeah. that you put a rope or something, or, or, or like long wooden sticks, yeah. so you cannot keep going. And they put uh, three or four Simca Rally 2 
all lifted up in the rear, no rear tires. So this was your barricade for your wedding. Yeah, and my friends, they put up the cars. So <laughs> and then my wife <laughs> and me, we had to put the rear tires and with a high with a with a jack, and then put the tires on, get the cars down, and then they moved the cars away, and then we could go to the restaurant. So uh, so are there wedding pi- are there in your photo album for your wedding? Are there pictures of her in her wedding dress putting tires on a car? I think she has pictures probably somewhere. Yeah, you definitely. Man, you married the right woman. I tell you. That is incredible. Yeah. I can barely get a woman to go in a car just on a romantic drive up the coast, let alone get in a wedding dress and take the tires and put them on and off a car. No, no. I mean, sh- there was no other way. And she's yeah. not the, the girl just letting me doing this. I mean, yeah. she was used to changing tires anyway. Yeah, yeah. From the autocross driving and so on. That's you incredible. always change tires. Okay, so now you're, you're, you've sold your cars. You're, you're, you're an adult. You're married now. You're out of university. What happens? Yeah, then university was finished and... And no military. So you didn't do the military. No military, yeah. And then uh, I hired in BMW. So they came a call. No internship before that? You didn't no, you no. The that summers? No, that was anyway strange. There was a crisis, economic uh, crisis in Germany. And my wife, she had a good job in Cologne as an mm-hmm. interior designer. Wow, okay. Yeah. So, and she was working on, on, on uh, bars for the, for the Kölsch, mm-hmm. Kölsch breweries. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, so her company made all these interiors for the nice college bars. Mm-hmm. And, of course, it would be nice to work for Ford mm-hmm. in Cologne. Yeah, right there. But, as you know, in the early 70s, there was always this fight. Ford Capri against the BMW 3.5 CSL, and I was the ultimate BMW enthusiast. Of I had course. I had my own homemade flag in the Nürburgring. I was the first person waving a flag in the Nürburgring. A BMW flag? Of course, the M flag. I made it myself. I still have it somewhere. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. So, so you m- wait. No, hold on. Let's point this out. You made a homemade M flag when you were just graduating college, university. Mm-hmm. You later end up running that. No, at that division. time, at that time, I was uh, fifteen or sixteen. That was in even sem- it makes an even more interesting with story. With sixteen, uh, that was seventy-three. I know, like yesterday. And you got it. You had it figured out at fifteen years old. Anyway, okay. So she's working in mm-hmm. Cologne, mm-hmm. and you are a BMW guy. So what happened? Yeah. So. And then I, of course, I, I sent my resume to Ford and Opel and other companies close by. But there was a crisis and no company was hiring. Yeah. The only company hiring was BMW. Terrible so for you. So, and my wife fully understood the situation and yeah. agree. okay, you go south, you go yeah. to Munich. But and it's also a great city to live in. Yeah, yeah. and six months later, after the, the, the test period then, mm-hmm. Okay, she also come to Munich. What was your first job there? What was the first role? I was a uh, chassis testing engineer. So what were you doing? Were you driving just BMWs or competitive cars? No, in the first seven months or so, I was working on steering systems, mm-hmm. sensitivity of rack and pinion mm-hmm. steering, shimmy and such things. And then s- in the neighbor group, someone went to other company or so, and they needed someone in the, the shock absorber mm-hmm. suspension group. And then I moved there, and that was much more entertaining. So I was it in the group who does all the chassis tuning. Shock was always and was drop. this chassis tuning for a specific line of car or for all BMWs? All, all b- at that time, BMW was a small company. That, that yeah. group did all the chassis tunings on all BMWs. So you're in your early 20s, and you're working on what would become the... Well, actually, in, if it's 83... There was already a six series. There was a seven series. It was a ma- mm-hmm. the product line had matured at that point. My first notch life and tuning I did with uh, E24 uh, when it shifted to pressurized gas shock absorbers. So that was my first Nurburgring tuning, and I think my first tuning or second tuning was the first M Technic suspension yeah. on E30 You're with, w- me. with Bildstein. That was my first tuning down in Italy in Bari. For the first time, when you're at when you're at the Nurburgring on BMW's payroll, and you're testing cars, did you stop and think, I used to be here with a homemade flag with my dad? Yeah, but before I drove the Nordsch Life uh, yeah. many times with race cars, and when I had a new car, I took it to the Nurburgring for a few laps to see yeah. how it is doing. So, Nurburgring Nordsch Life, I was very familiar with already. So it was not that. So it wasn't a special moment. No, it wasn't. I mean, it was a special moment because this E24, there are th- three, four areas where it fully yeah. took off all the time. <laughs> 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 so uh, and and then I was uh, the young engineer in the group. Point. I think it 
all came together. You know, when you at that time when you go to Italy and you do a chassis tuning in Italy, you need all the custom stuff. You need uh, spare parts, you need technicians, everything. You need to organize everything, mm -hmm. hotels. It was so much the same like my racing. Yeah. When I did the racing, I went to Netherlands, Belgium, and so on. Yeah. The way, y what the things you need to organize, uh, the, the technical stuff, spare parts, everything. Yeah, you learn to be on time because the grid is not waiting for you. you know, Obviously, and yeah. Meet the homologation and all these things. It was so much like my racing. So it just, everything came easy. But then after two and a half years in this chassis group, uh, there was a chance to go to BMW M. At that time, BMW Motorsport. So racing and developing the first E30 M3. What year was this? 80? So well, that came out in 87, right? The that, e was that was end of 85. In December 85, I joined BMW Motorsport. But the car came out in 87, the yeah. E30 M3. Right, yeah, yeah. But uh, so when I joined BMW Motorsport, my boss at that time said, one thing is clear, Mr. Biermann. Yeah. You will never work on the race car. <laughs> you, you will only work on the road car M3 and other cars because the people who are working for BMW Motorsport for a long time, they deserve working on the motorsport programs. And he knew I was already working intensely with Linda. Yeah. On the three at that time already, yeah, 323. Sometimes we could even beat the Schnitzer Coupe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it was all doing well. And he said, oh, no problem, but I have to escape from my boss in the other company. You know? yeah. So I joined the subsidiary of BMW Motorsport. And then everybody was so busy in BMW Motorsport with the road car. Tons of issues, you know. Small team, make a first time a whole new car. Yeah. The only guy who had some time to make the race car was me. <laughs> so more or less <laughs> accidentally, I... All of a sudden, I was in charge of the E30 M3 Group A race car development. Not everything, yeah. no, no powertrain. Yeah. So engine was in the engine department. Yeah. But basically everything else today, probably they would call such person a project lead yeah. uh, and test engineer. But nobody had the time. So I was just doing almost everything. Every night my bosses come to the workshop. I had uh, two technicians on the car and the yeah. workshop manager. And at that time, there was no CAD. Yeah. It was all like, okay, we build a car. Hardcore on when paper the, with, with rulers. When the part is ready, we give it to the engineering design person. He makes the drawing, and that's it. So, and it took a year to develop that first. So, you were 25, 26 at this point? No, in that at that time, I was already 29. 29, and you're running a race car, building a race car for BMW of yeah, all car yeah, companies. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so I did all the test driving with Roberto Ravaglia. Yeah. And so, and it, it was, uh, I mean, this is what I always wanted to do. But you got there at 29. I mean, think about mm -hmm. this. By 87, BMW was BMW. Like, well, what we know BMW today, mm -hmm. or really, it's, it's, pr it's reputation, it was already cemented by 87, and you're already, you're 29, not even 30, working on race cars. That's incredible. Yeah, but that was always my script. Uh, that in, in 73, when I was there with my flag and so on, yeah. and uh, Nerpasch was there, yeah, and uh, I was like, okay, this was w what Johan Nerpasch is doing there. Yeah. This, this is what I want to do in the future. So you knew, this was, it wasn't like you just kind of fell into it. It was by design. I'm going to become an engineer. I'm going to go back into the racing world, and I'm going to build race cars. Yeah, that, that was, was the plan. That was the plan. Yeah. And I had that plan when I was 15, 16 years old. Uh, also working as a designer in certain areas, a whole roll cage concept, fuel system, and so on. There was nobody there. There were no. We didn't have many engineers for the race car. You just did what so you had to with do. the workshop, and so and we, we we built that car basically from the workshop. And later, then we got one professional engineering designer for motorsport. <laughs> <laughs> but a, a little bit later, all the other things the engineering designer did it as a as a job on top in the evening. Yeah. yeah. So it worked very well. That car still today probably is the most successful uh, touring car of all times. That racing was not so easy. Mm. You know, it, we were very successful. But there was a little bit of drama with regulations and so on. And my boss is yeah, not fully happy. And always we had uh, reporting. And I mean, in the European Championship, I was in charge in 87. We, we win everything. So that was easy. Then my old boss in uh, chassis development, yeah. uh, he offered me a job to become a team leader. I was still a regular engineer. in Back at Olympia Centro, at right. Tatering 130. Yeah, right. Okay. So at that time, it was close to Fitz in the Hufelandstrasse. Oh, yeah, yeah, just north. So he offered me the job and said, oh, okay, after two years of having this fun, maybe it's also time yeah. to think about family, slow down a little bit. I mean, 
I, I was working like maniac. I had eight weeks without a free day or so at that time yeah. in motorsport. So, and then, okay, I go back to chassis development and become team leader in this chassis area where I worked before. And yeah, then it was time to settle down a little bit, start family. We got a son and a daughter. Mm -hmm. And I did this, I think, for seven years then. Was more I was in charge of this uh, suspension the team. And then I got <coughs> the control shock absorber team integrated. And there was for a For all car lines? All or every just everything. So again, back yeah. to all BMWs. Yeah, and then I could integrate the uh, advanced development team yeah. also and the laboratory. So I had a really a powerhouse. Yeah. yeah. It was very strong, my team at that time. And, and this is when BMW was really growing volume too. Because you're getting into the mid early early to mid 90s at this point. Yeah, that was then 94. I moved to BMW North America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there. Oh, New Jersey. Yeah, right. Across the river from me. Yeah, we uh, we had a task force at that time in the early 90s. The business was really going down. I mean, Lexus coming, Infinity coming. I remember. And so big drama in BMW. And then like the typical situation, salespeople say, ah, oh, the product is not good enough. We cannot sell. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a normal thing. It's always yeah. like that. It was a very you good. You would think they wouldn't say that at BMW, though. No, no, no. It was the same thing. At that time, I didn't know. Yeah. So uh, we, I make, uh, we had this task force. My boss said, OK, you please manage everything. And so I organized visiting, going through the US four or five different places yeah. and meeting people, customers, dealers, and so on. And that was the first time I was in the US. And at that time, the boss of after sales, Hans Dünsel in uh, BMW, I liked him a lot. Mm -hmm. Like a very guy, you know, and not like talking so much bullshit, just straight, yeah. here we go. And I knew him. And since this task force, it was 92 maybe, so we always had the contact. Every time he came to Munich, I showed mm. him the latest and greatest cars and tunings and how do we do for the US and yeah. so on. It was almost an informal thing. And then at some time, there was a job available. The person who did the local development, mm -hmm. he went back to Germany. And then he just called and say, hey, I, I, I need a guy here. What about coming over? So I checked with my family. Yeah. And then, okay, yeah, here we go. So we go to New Jersey. We're across the river to the Jersey side. Yeah, together with the kids. They were okay. three and a half and five years old at that time. Okay. And it was a fantastic experience. Okay, so now you move to the U.S. Now, I, I did this in reverse. I, li you know, I, I lived in Germany. You and I worked together for six months. Do you realize this? In 1992. Uh, I didn't buy a car there. But then when I moved to England, I had to buy a car I couldn't get living in the U.S. So what did you buy? that you couldn't get in Europe. You had to have bought a car. Yeah, when we lived in New oh. Jersey, yeah. I, uh, for the summertime to, to go to the beaches, we bought an uh, Oldsmobile 69, Cutlass Supreme. So you, wait a minute, you, a didn't, convertible, get a, you convertible. didn't get a race car? No, I mean, th the racing, I, I did. It's done. It, it was done and I, I, that was okay. Yeah. I love that, so not even a 442, it's just a no, regular car. it was a regular, Supreme. but I, I I made it into two, so I changed the rear bumper, yeah. and I had an exhaust uh, builder making the 442 exhaust system. Yeah. But the first thing I is I changed the shock absorbers. So now it actually has some driving dynamics to it. Yeah, it, yeah. it can stay on the road. What I, so it's the 350 in there? Uh, it's a small V8 in yeah, there. Yeah, the 350, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful car. Yeah, it's candy apple red, and we still have it in Munich. Wait, they didn't come in can candy apple No, it, it is the guy who refurbished it. He yeah. made it candy apple, and yeah. I liked we liked the car. So. so you brought it back over to Munich? Yes. So yeah. you must be like the only dude in Munich driving around in an Oldsmobile. Yeah, but there was another one around in yellow. So I never met the person, but uh, we were uh, really surprised when we, we just yeah. cross on the road, and then we see the same car in, yeah. in yellow. So you, what would you guys go down, like Cape May or Long Beach Island and that thing? Yeah, we went to the New Jersey beaches uh, yeah. on the summertime, and the kids liked it so much. And okay. they said, no, I wanted to sell it. And my kids said, no, 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 this car, we, we can never sell it. It has to go to Germany. So, uh, and how did you like the job? How did you like the role working in the U.S.? Oh, that was interesting. My, my network within BMW was basically exploding. Yeah. Uh, because I got so many jobs for testing in the U.S., and... All of a sudden, I'm not just working on chassis and, and or a race car. Yeah. Uh, I work on, I mean, we did our own accessory development then for the Z3. Yeah. So we were. I'd like to point out, I had one. Okay. So thank you. Nice job. <laughs> okay. So we work on floor mats, but also we work on first generation navigation system, yeah. alarm systems. 
all kind of stuff, a lot of testing, all season tires, US specific brakes, US specific uh, transmission applications, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And also then I was part of uh, the important meeting every week that was product circle. So I was part of that. So I understand how a sales company, how sales operation is working. Mm -hmm. So, and I made good friends in my time there and they mm -hmm. were very helpful later on. Instead of a word from our sponsors, a brief interruption. As you can imagine, all of us here are incredibly excited about the return of Inside the Moto Man Studio. So much so, we'd like to bring you more guests, more frequently, and in the future, make some of these live town hall events. So to that end, we'd like to ask you a favor. Can you help us get the word out? There are two really easy ways to do this. First and foremost, can you share the show, Inside the Moto Man Studio, on your favorite social platforms, that includes Reddit. I would argue Reddit is even more important than the usual suspects. And then second, this is now a podcast. So go to your favorite podcast directory and subscribe, rate, and review inside the Moto Man studio. However you choose to help us, we'd be greatly appreciative. And now back to this incredible story. I did this for three years and I probably would have done it a lot longer, but then Motorsport, BMW Motorsport approached me uh, they wanted to do a DTM program right. and I said no guys forget it. I've been there I've done that and I don't need that anymore mm -hmm. find some other person and yeah, yeah, then my old buddies from motorsport. They all call hey, wait Why don't you come back? Why don't you join? I said hey no, guys. I mean, I know it all I've been there I, I don't need it again then human resources step in and say hey, mr. Bim you always had these nice jobs, you know mm -hmm. So now the company really asks you to take that job I said what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, we want you to take that job. So I talk again with family. Yeah. Because motorsport. You I say mean, with family. You talk with your wife, your brothers, your no, kids. My, my wife, my okay, wife, basically, yeah. because I knew that this is a lot of work. Yeah. You know, I mean motorsport, and uh, so anyway, I go there, and then I'm back to motorsport. Mm. My boss in BMW M at that time told me, "Women, forget it. This DTM project will never come alive." Yeah. So he made a kind of contract. If DTM dies, BMN is back in M. I said, okay, no problem. He we made that with HR or with, with you? With HR. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and basically with me. And I said, okay, no problem. We can do so like that. So the company is literally twisting your arm to go out and build a race car team. Yeah, to, to do this DTM program. Yeah. I feel terrible for you, man. Real tough yeah. life. Yeah. So, but of course, uh, my boss in M was right. So they never got the funding. Yeah. It didn't happen. Formula One was a big thing at mm -hmm. that time in BMW Motorsport. It was this core of the good old guys who know what BMW stands for, what it means, and, and they did all the racing, yeah, together with Schnitzer and so on. So, and then it was clear to me if if I drop this job and I go back to M. Probably the whole like touring car racing, GT racing is almost dying. Mm. So I sit with my old guys and say, so what do you think what's going to happen? And then they were clear, oh, if, if you go back now, that's probably it. Maybe we do some customer racing, but mm. so I decided, no, then I do not go back to M. And we, I make sure <laughs> this stuff is not so dying. So you stayed there for the good of the team, the good f good of the race team. Yeah, for the real BMW heritage, yeah. touring car racing, GT racing, yeah, where, yeah. where BMW grew strong. Yeah, I never was a friend of Formula One. Yeah, what year was this? About where are we at now? What year wise? That was 2000 and yeah, 2000. 2000. This okay, was so 2000. 39 times. Yeah. So then I decide, okay, I stay there. Uh -huh. And there was some leftover budget from the Le Mans racing. Uh -huh. And then I visit my buddies from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And they were racing uh, with the E36, E46 M3. Uh, they were six cylinder. They were racing against the Porsches mm -hmm. and very successful for two, three years or so. But then the Porsche guys figured out something and they beat them. So they were not competitive anymore. And then I talked with the guys and yeah, we want to have a V8. We want to have a V8 M3. And uh, we already had an idea about the engine for the DTM. Mm -hmm. And we said, okay, when we make the, the script for that engine, it should be capable for DTM regulations, mm -hmm. but also then good for this to beat the Porsches in the US. But okay. DTM was still on the list somewhere. But yeah. So then BMW North America agree. So we had a breakfast meeting, my boss, Mr. Tyson, and Tom Purvis at that time, and I make a six-pager. Yeah. And uh, so the and then just saying the Porsche killer. 
Yeah. <laughs> so and and by the way, we need five million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, we, we cannot make the first two races, but we will win the championship. Yeah. And he looked at me like, it's a great idea. This guy must be fully <laughs> crazy. <laughs> but he trusted somehow, yeah. and we started the project. And then we developed the M3 race car with the V8, brand new V8 engine. Yeah, yeah. And later, as a very similar engine went into production for yeah. the uh, uh, E90 M3. Yeah. But at that time, regulation for American Le Mans racing only required one road car. Yeah. So w we also developed the road car with the V8 engine. Of course you did. So we do racing, and we beat the Porsches, and we win all the championships, and yeah. that was Does a that funny time. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but five million dollars to do all that sounds cheap. Oh no, we had yeah, we had some money still from the Le Mans project. Oh, so you had a little bit budget left. How yeah. like how much would it cost to do that same thing today? Uh, probably f four times the number of people, and probably three times the time. We did this in less than six months, and I started with thirty-seven people, and only with five million dollars. No, oh, we, ha we had, a, we had a little bit more money. I, I can't tell you exactly how much money it was, but it would probably today cost at least five times the money. So where along the way have you learned the business side? You were an engineer, but where have you, because obviously you're knowing business at this point, because you're, you're lead of whole products at this point. I, I wouldn't call it business. Uh, you have an idea, yeah. you want to get this going, and then you talk with friends, and then you get things going. <laughs> <laughs> And that was a big money spending in Formula One. And we won in 2003, we won the championship, European championship for manufacturers. And there was not even the budget to print some posters, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the money was just burning in Formula One, you know. Yeah. And I was thinking, maybe this is not the right place for me anymore. Yeah. I, I don't want to retire on this job. So that was the first time when I went to HR, or the boss of R&D, and I said, hey, I, ne I need a new job. That was the only time in my wow. career, all the time before, someone asked me Can to join. But that time I said, okay, this is nice, and I think I did my job here, but I, I need to do some different job for the mm. future. I can't do this until I retire. Mm. After almost 10 years being in uh, North America, being in M, being in motorsport, everything out of core of R&D, mm -hmm. I come back to R&D. And I became the overall project leader of second generation BMW X5. And then doing <laughs> that, uh, there was a change in management in BMW M, mm -hmm. and he asked me to join. It becomes so a. Hold on, let's not gloss over the second gen I X5. This is, if I'm getting this all correct, this is your first mature business because you guys, so well, not you guys, but BMW, they sold 700,000 of those of that second generation car. Yeah, the E70 was quite successful car. Very successful. And for me, it was very interesting experience. We had the factory in the US. Yeah. So and you, uh, as a project leader, you are probably, you're involved in every part of the project. Mm. Uh, all the financial discussions, uh, sales uh, stuff, the production, and of course, engineering. But then I got the call and yeah, I, I went to a BMW M again. And then beca I became boss of R&D of M. So th the call was, forget about these other jobs, now you're the boss. Yeah. Now, so now you completely control R&D, you control the direction. Yeah, but just for M. Well, I understand, but mm. you're coming back now a third time to M. Right. But now you, this is your vision, your show. But it was not so easy, you know. There was a lot of trouble. The board couldn't accept anymore all the money spending for yeah. the specific engine programs and so on and so on. But the biggest challenge was to shift the whole BMW M from natural aspirated to turbo. Yeah. That was very challenging because many people didn't want to go there. Was that your decision or was that BMW no. corporate? That was a headquarter decision. Because of fuel economy or taxation? What? I think they were just tired of spending all the money all the time. And many things had been promised about uh, the, the specific M engines, but some part of it probably really never Is happened. Is turbocharging cheaper to develop? Uh, th those engines were more based on the normal engine. We oh. didn't develop like whole new engines. Oh, I yeah? understand. And there was a lot of synergy. Ich verstehe. Yeah. Yeah. The, the way we, we developed those engines from the very beginning, we worked together with the base engine development and we tried to arrange this with a lot of synergies, but still good performance. And I mean, the, the first turbo, the V8 turbo M5, I mean, that thing had power like crazy. Three things you wanted to bring to M. What were three specific things you wanted to do at M? Put aside turbocharging. Mm. Yeah, first of all, uh, get the whole team aligned yeah. uh, for this new strategy. 
you know, because many people never wanted to do that. Yeah. They were all uh, in this romance of natural aspirated engine and so on, and uh, they were thinking we lose a little bit of our independence, mm -hmm. but probably that independence has become too expensive mm -hmm. you know, for the company. So there was a clear order to do like this, and okay, then, I mean, what to do, what the challenge was with this turbo power, mm -hmm. get the emotion in the car mm -hmm. in a similar way, so develop a high refing turbo engine, and then th those were the challenges. Yeah. Then at that time I got the call from uh, Hyundai. And so uh, this is 2014. This was in 14 yeah. in the summer 14, and so I think there was a, a good moment to. No, I'm going to stop you here for a minute. You get the call. Is it? Are you like? You thinking this is one of your friends pulling a joke on you? It's like Hyundai, like that old commercial, Hyundai hot gavonen, <laughs> Hyundai hot gavonen. <laughs> I don't know that one. <laughs> no, but uh, the HR person from uh, Hyundai Motorsport in yeah. Alzenau, he called, and I listened to him, and I said, "Oh, forget it. Uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not going to work." Did you, said, did, what, did you dismiss him because it's Hyundai, or you just I want to stay no, at BMW? No, no, I, 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 I was really surprised. I yeah. Uh, and said, forget it. I said, oh, no problem. I, maybe I call you two weeks later. Yeah. And then I started to think about. What uh, was what was he offering you? Uh, j just to, to talk, to start talks. So he, he didn't say, we want to give you this specific role. It's, mm. let's have a discussion. Uh, there was, uh, okay, we want to do high performance and so on. And yeah. we need someone to do that. And uh, then. And this was for Hyundai and Kia or just Hyundai? Uh, at How that time, it? that was all not clear to me. Okay. I, I had even no idea that Hyundai and Kia, this is like the same company, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I researched about Korea. That mm. was the first thing I did. What, what is South Korea? And then I was fascinated by the history of South Korea. Yeah. Uh, all the war. And it was so much similar to Germany. And, but there was a big difference. I mean, South Korea, they got all this, this, this harmful uh, time. And they didn't start the stupid things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other countries started the stupid things and and they were suffering so much from that yeah and in germany it's different so germany we started all that yeah. stuff you know <coughs> and we didn't deserve any better i think and then i look into okay what is hyundai and what is kia and so on and so i i see this and i see their growth and i said wow <coughs> there must be some magic behind yeah and i was really curious yeah and i mean there was already for two, three years, I was thinking, we are here in good old Europe, but there's so much pace in other places, yeah. in Japan, in Korea, and so on. And it's almost kind of boring. And uh, I already had talks with HR at that time. I, I finished the next M5, mm -hmm. and then I retire. And th that would have been end of last year. And uh, that was my plan, because it wasn't so exciting. Yeah, but what are you going to do when you retire? Oh, I had no idea. And then Dr. Kwon... Uh, basically the person who hired me uh, he came to Munich we met in a hotel and he explained to me and I tell him about my story and what I did and so on and then he said oh yeah maybe you can do not only high performance maybe you can also do uh, the other car uh, test division and so on uh, with all your experience it could be very helpful mm. but it's your choice if you want to do it or not okay guys now first we take a vacation and then we let you know and then, oh, vacation, vacation, I mean, why, why do you take vacation? Just come over to Seoul. So my wife and me, we fly to Seoul. Yeah. And then we were really surprised about South Korea, seeing it for the first time, how modern, how clean, how well organized everything is. But also the, the talks that I had with Vice Chairman Chang, with Dr. Kwon again, the respect they gave you. Yeah. I, I could never feel this in BMW in my 30 years before, you know, you, you were well fully... Well, hold on, no, stop there for a minute. When mm. you say respect, mm. what's different about the respect? Because in every, with the exception of one role at BMW, everyone sought you out. To me, that sounds like respect. Yeah, but in, Bubble, in BMW at that time, when I thought it's better to retire soon, you know, you, you the, the, as the engineer, you yeah. were basically the person who is spending all the money, yeah. And uh, of course there is mistakes, you So know. you were the problem. Yeah, you are you are more than a problem than an asset. I you understand. Yeah, so people made you feel like that. I totally understand. And when then I come to this different company and yeah. that everybody admires you almost and and is very interested in you, you well know. Well, you're the head of BMW, BM, man, you're the mm -hmm. you're a god to them. 
Yeah, yeah, but uh, at home you were not the get god. You were just the guy spending all the money, making all the mistakes. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was a little bit the way I felt it. Nowadays, hopefully, that has changed. Yeah. When they're going through the recruiting process, did they trot out Peter and have Peter sit down with you and say, hey, this has been my experience? Because granted, he comes from a different function, but he also comes from a large German car manufacturer. Yeah, uh, we were lucky. When we were visiting uh, Seoul yeah. and the company, Peter was there yeah. accidentally, and then I asked for a brief meeting with Peter. Of course he did. So we I don't think it was there accidentally. No I no think no they had him there. No, 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 no. He had a meeting or viewing, whatever. I don't know. Did you know Peter before that? No, no, no. No Never. idea. No idea. So, yeah, we talked a little bit, and I think when we said goodbye, then I think he understood, oh, this is the guy from M. And then he said, oh, oh may maybe we can really <laughs> make great cars. <laughs> For the first 45 minutes, I felt he, he really couldn't, he didn't get couldn't it. see it yeah, so yeah. much. But then when we said goodbye, oh, oh yeah, that well, yeah, could be great. So the, the Stinger was, was more than on the drawing board at that point. The Stinger was a real project. Some of this other stuff was a real project, like the Genesis was a real project. Yeah, the G70 I saw in clay. Yeah. Uh, they showed me later then in Rüsselsheim. Yeah. In the uh, Rüsselsheim studio. I could see the Stinger in the studio in clay. So, and the cars looked just great. When I saw the G70, the clay model, I said, wow. Did they show you things like on the other end of the spectrum? Did they show you like the Nexo? Did they show you at that No, at that time there was no Nexo. No Nexo. I mean, uh, 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 no, no discussion about Nexo. Yeah. But uh, Stinger, uh, Genesis, Vice Chairman Chang already told me at that time there is some thoughts about luxury yeah. brand. But first we have to make sure we, we have the performance level yeah. to, to go there. It was more and more clear I, I should do more than just high performance. Uh, do the serial production the cars. Do the, the uh, performance development. And was it clear from the outset, Hyundai and Kia, or just Hyundai or just Kia? No, that was all clear, Hyundai, Kia. So and both. Uh, yeah, yeah, and also then later, Genesis. And uh, I was thinking, I mean, I was thinking, oh, do I need this extra stress? But Dr. Kwan said, ah, you don't need to really fully just be there and yeah, give some consultants and so on and yeah. so on. But uh, of course, I mean, I, I cannot do like that either. I do the things right or yeah. I leave it. So and now I'm spending much more time with the other cars. Than and was it, it was it understood you were moving to Korea or were you going to do the, the, the what Peter does where he lives in Frankfurt and travels around? No, no, that was clear. Th that job can only be done out of Korea. So I you mean, were going to move to Korea? Yeah. I mean, there was a team already there for high performance, but doing this out of Germany, also all the the, the, the performance development and all the other cars to to start out of Germany, you, you, I, I could never have that impact. I spent yeah. so much time with engineers driving cars and discussing with them. And okay. th that is a key element, to talk with the people, drive with the people. And uh, to that, that I could not do this. Maybe after one or two years, you can have an office in Munich, uh, in Germany or so. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, life in Korea was, was so great. So you and your now. wife like it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Other otherwise, we wouldn't be there anymore. What is your wife's name? <laughs> Brigitte. But it, sh she has had an amazing journey with you. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Kind of, yeah, yeah. What was the conversation like? You go to her boss and like, not only am I leaving, I'm going to Hyundai. No, I didn't say that <laughs> where I go. I was just saying, okay, I'm out and that's it. Oh, you didn't tell them? No, no. What happened when they found out? Did I they call you like, are you crazy? Or I have no, yeah, probably many people thought like that. Yeah. Wow. But you're different. I mean, Peter... He was the trailblazer, man. People, I'm sure the people at Volkswagen Group are like, this guy has lost his mind. Now you look back on it, he was a genius. You had a little bit of a, like he kind of went and did this path first, so you kind of saw that it can be done. To streamline everything yeah. and to guide for clear direction, to yeah. driving characters and so on. What were three things you wanted to do when you got there? What was like your three, this is the first thing, first three things I want to get to first to understand this new company yeah you know, I had no I had no clue and uh, still today I don't understand every aspect of, of our operations I mean it's a huge company you know? yeah it's also a completely different culture so that that was definitely challenging and yeah then of course bring this, this high performance thing alive mm -hmm. and uh, then I was also clear we need a team in Germany to do all this testing in Nürburgring. That was clear to me, a uh, high performance car you, you do in Nürburgring and no other place. And so to build that team up and... I think it's funny, here we are now, what, 40 years later from when you built that, or made that flag yourself, 40 years later, 
and you're still focused on the Nürburgring, and you live halfway across the world. Yeah, but that, that is a place where you make such cars. Let's assume I, I don't know what the Nürburgring is. Why is it the place that you make such cars? That's the best road on the world without oncoming traffic. That's a very fair point. <laughs> okay, so this is a hell of a story. The journey you have traveled. But now we're at the point where you are in your current role, you are running performance as well as really engineering for or driving dynamics for two major car companies. Let's turn around, look back. And I would argue you've had, you're, I like to use this term wealthy, and I don't mean money. Wealthy in terms of you've had people along the way that have ha guided you, your father, then your brothers took over that role, and then these people you raced with, then all these people at BMW that came out of the woodworks, hey, Albert, come work for me here, come work for me there. What, I, what would you say are the three things in life, the three things that you are most grateful for that helped you get you to this point today? Mm. I think the most important thing is that uh, you do what you love to do. And I, when I had to decide for something, I always decided for my heart, mm. not so much for the brains. <laughs> okay. I d always decided wh where is the excitement, wh where is the new thing, mm. where is the new challenge. I, I think the one key element uh, in my whole life was to de always decide when I had the choice for, for the unknown, for the new. Mm. Yeah? So where, where you find a new challenge, mm. where you're not continuing with your routine. Like uh, when I go to the motorsport, when I go to US, and it was the same script now to go to Korea. When I stayed in BMW, I could write down what I would do until <coughs> I retire. When I decided to go to Korea, I had no idea what would happen in Korea. Mm. And that was a fascinating thing. And I, whenever I had the choice, I decided f by my heart for the new, for the unknown, and not so much with the brain calculating about, oh, what is the risk, what can go wrong? Yeah. I don't care for that so much. Okay. Uh, things will, will go the right way anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm very confident always that things will be okay. Okay. And uh, so I basically made my hobby into my job. Okay. And then things come easy. Yeah, of course, it's not always just fun. There mm -hmm. are days when you're just stressed and you don't know how to fix things. Mm. But still, there's always the good part. And in working with people, driving cars, and talk about cars, that is always when I think people can be really strong. I've been doing fooling around with politics and so on. Mm. Th this is not what I love to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I rather work with engineers, make a good car, mm. make the right procedures more efficient, make the right structure that people can collaborate nicely yeah, and effective. I think those things, and uh, to bring the people together, I think that especially when you make high performance car, that's a key thing. You have to have the people together, you have to discuss about what you experience mm -hmm. in the car to guide them, and then things can happen. Do you think what you, your journey that we've just covered, do you think the same thing could happen in today's environment of a car company and the car world, or really any corporate world for that matter? Yeah, I don't know, I mean, I. I joined BMW in a time when the company was growing a lot. Mm. I got responsibility in my assignments very early on a pretty high level. And that absolutely you did, sir. And with every kind of job, you kind of grow. You make mistakes, mm. you learn from your mistakes or not, I mean. <laughs> and I think that is a key element to become strong, mm. that you do different challenges and you are happy with what you do. Mm. And that gives you some power yeah, to move things that not necessarily people might think that was possible. I understand. Yeah. And now you've just renewed your contract again. Where do you go from here? I mean, my, my contract was for three years and it automatically it extends another two years. Yeah. And this is my first extension, and I have no idea how many <laughs> extensions <laughs> can come. I mean, at some point, we, we definitely want to go back to Europe. Yeah. I mean, we have a granddaughter now in Sweden. Yeah. And, uh, in Sweden? Yeah, in Sweden. Okay. So I'm we, are, we are happy right now in Korea, 
and yeah, I don't know when the time has come to say okay, goodbye, sorry. but it's it's a still very exciting. Uh, we we get surprised, positive surprises mm. almost every week. Uh, we never felt uncomfortable mm. in Korea. It's a great country, great people, and it's good to be there. Sir, I I am blown away by this journey. Thank you very much for sharing it with yeah, me. Yeah, you're welcome. Many thanks for joining us throughout the entirety of this episode. And don't forget, subscribe, rate, and review Inside the Moto Man Studio on your favorite podcast directory. And while you're sharing, how about on your socials as well as on Reddit? Until our next incredible guest, bis später. <laughs>